Good morning, everybody. Today is April 8th, and the shutdown, the lockdown due to the spread of the coronavirus continues. And according to some statistics that I was able to gather this morning, here in the United States, there have so far been 402,000 cases of people infected with the virus and roughly 13,000 deaths. And in the United, in New York State, as of yesterday, there have been 5,500 deaths. Now we have to remember that the, these deaths are not merely abstract statistics, but these represent the passing out of this life of real human beings. These were people with lives just like our own, people had, who had hoped to have a long lifespan, who had hoped for good health, who had their projects, their wishes, their hopes, their aspirations, people who had family members who loved them and cherished them, who had friends who also loved them and cherished them. And now as this terrible virus spreads, it robs the world of each of these people. And so we should call them to mind with thoughts of sympathy, particularly for their friends and relatives. And I also hope that everybody who is watching this is maintaining good health through this very trying period, very um, severe test of our patience, of a determination of our equanimity. And it's particularly, I want to emphasize again, that it's particularly important to adhere strictly to the guidelines laid down by the health authorities to observe what is called social distan distancing, to remain in one's place of residence to the base, best of one's ability, to avoid meeting with people out in groups, and to always wash one's hands with soap to wash them for 20 seconds, to avoid touching the face with one's hands, and um, to try to remain fixed within one's place of residence to the best of one's ability. Today I want to speak about two particular problems that arise as we are observing the lockdown, as we are observing these stay at home orders. One of the problems arises when we're staying at home in a place in which there are several other people, our family members or friends or roommates. The other problem is a problem that arises when we are observing the lockdown or stay at home alone. So each of these conditions has its own set of problems. And I want to see what we can find within the Buddha's teachings and Buddha's practice that can help us deal with each of these challenges. First comes the challenge of staying in a fixed residence with other people, family members, roommates, friends. And what happens under these conditions is when one is living in close association with others, close, in close quarters with others, rubbing elbows with others throughout the day without any chance to break out and to go off on one's own, it tends to give rise to feelings of tension, hostility, irritation, annoyance, and this could lead to unpleasant incidents outbreaks of violent speech, abusive and aggressive speech, or sometimes in some cases even to physical violence. So how can we avoid letting the cramped conditions that we're observing grate our nerves and become a condition for the arising of disagreeable behavior? Okay, there are several measures that we might draw upon. First, certain practices that we can undertake. One practice that's useful is for everybody who is living in the same 
residence, the same facility, at the beginning of the active day, perhaps at breakfast time or after breakfast, to get together, of course, observing a certain distance between yourselves, but sitting around the table or in the same room, the chairs place the comfortable distance apart and make the determination, each one makes the determination together that no matter what happens in the course of the day, one is going to remain patient and peaceful and not allow this, um, these cramped conditions to give rise to outbursts of angry speech or of aggressive behavior. So when one makes that determination, everybody making the pledge to follow those guidelines, it acts on a curb on one's behavior. So naturally, feelings of irritation might arise, feelings of annoyance, displeasure with some of your roommates, family members, roommates or friends. But when those feelings of irritation and annoyance arise, you recognize them for what they are and you recall the pledge, the resolution that you all made together, and then you make an effort to prevent that annoyance from erupting in the form of disagreeable conduct. And so one of the instruments that one can use to control the irritation is the practice of mindfulness. And in this case, it would be a kind of chitanupasana an exercise of contemplation of the mind, or perhaps a form of dhammanupasana, contemplation of mental factors. In this case, the mental factor of ill will. So rather than letting that irritation and annoyance govern the mind and control and ex one's behavior and express itself in one's behavior, one notes the state of mind, irritation, annoyance, ill will, and then one can either observe that state of mind or one makes until it fades away and disappears, or one can make an active effort to suppress it. And in any case, one should control one's behavior. A more direct antidote is to bring up the feeling of loving kindness towards the people who are causing the irritation. So instead of letting the angry, Resentful thoughts continue to run through the mind. As that irritation arises, you bring forth the thought that we are all living under the same conditions. These conditions might be difficult for me, but they might also be difficult for the other person. And we are all observing these regulations, this stay at home practice, in order to protect ourselves from contracting the disease caused by the virus. And so you could think that we are all vulnerable to this illness. And in this way, one generates a feeling of loving kindness towards everybody in one's household, generating the wish, may they all be well, may they all be happy, may they all be safe, may they all be healthy. And if there's one person in particular that's causing the irritation, you can direct that contemplation towards the person who's responsible for the irritation. So this is a kind of practice that one could, or actually several practices, simple mindful observation of the mind, the more forceful suppression and elimination of the angry, resentful thoughts, and the application of the antidote, the antidote in this case being loving kindness. So these are antidotes that one could apply in the course of the day. Then what one could do at some point in the evening that everybody gets together, everybody who's living to together comes together, meets together again with sufficient distance between you, and you each offer to all the members of the group an apology for any kind of unwholesome behavior that one has indulged in or any kind of unwholesome thoughts that might have arisen towards the others in the course of the day. 
This is a common practice within the Buddhist monastic community. Generally, when one has at certain occasions, when we have the evening recitation, each member of the monastic community will, especially towards the elders, will make the determination, though kasavandami bhante, dvara tayena katang sabang achayang, kamata me bhante anukampang upadaya. So he'll say, I pay homage to you, Venerable One, if I have committed any transgressions through the three doors of action, through body, speech, or mind, that let the Venerable One pardon me out of compassion for me. So this doesn't have to be applied only by monks, but as family members get together, each one could say to the others, I address you all, I have respect and affection for you all, and if I have behaved wrongly in any way, through body, through speech, or through thought, please, all of you, pardon me. Recognize my fault, my transgression, and let us turn over and make a better start tomorrow. So these are some of techniques that one could use when living together with others under confined conditions that tend to give rise to irritation, annoyance, friction, friction that might explode in aggressive speech or bodily behavior. <clears throat> the other type of condition under which people might be living, which causes problems, and that is living alone. This is for people who don't have family members, don't have friends living with them, but they're living in an apartment, a room, by themselves, and don't have the opportunity to socialize with others. And they might feel the oppression of loneliness, isolation, alienation, and this can cause dejection, irritation, they might turn it inward upon themselves and start indulging in thoughts of self-depreciation. And this could even lead to deep depression, feeling of being completely isolated from others. So how do we deal with a condition like this? Again, there are several tools that the Buddha Dharma gives us. Well, first, even before turning to the Buddha Dharma, there's a very practical, you know, ordinary way in which we can break out of that cage of isolation and loneliness. Living in this modern time, we have access to electronic means of communication. We can use the telephone to call our friends or family members, speak to them, ask how they are, you know, express our good wishes for them. And particularly, there might be people that, like family members, friends, that we haven't communicated with for a long time. But now when we're all living under these very demanding conditions, this might be the time to contact them again and to renew old acquaintances and to express your concern for your family members, for your friends, even some colleagues or acquaintances, and through the means of the telephone, Skype, Zoom, or other means of communication, you can establish contact with them, communicate with them. And because we're all living under very challenging conditions, this provides the opportunity for establishing deeper relationships. Whereas when we're living under normal conditions, our contacts, our relationships might be rather superficial and not really touching the very depths of our being. But when we are all really staring in the face of a debilitating illness, even an illness which can turn lethal and take lives, this becomes the chance for us to establish much deeper, much more personal, more intimate relationships with our family members and friends. And so even though we might be living physically alone, but through telephone, Skype, Zoom, or other means, we can break out of our loneliness and establish communications with others. But also now coming 
within the domain of the Buddha Dharma, we should see the conditions of confinement and stay at home orders under which we're living to be a precious opportunity, an opportunity to go deeper inside through the cultivation of the practices of the Buddha Dhamma, particularly the practice of bhavana meditation. The Buddha says that he, this is shortly before he passed away, he instructed his disciples, the monastic disciples, to dwell as islands unto themselves, refuges unto themselves, taking no other island, no other refuge. And what is that island? What is that refuge that Buddha asked his disciples to rely upon? It is the four foundations of mindfulness. So when we take up the practice of developing the four foundations of mindfulness, which means in effect the systematic, formal, methodical practice of meditation, then we see the chance to live in solitude, to be staying alone, to be as a kind of liberation from our obligations to others, and a chance to look more deeply inside, to dwell deep inside ourselves, and to experience a peace, a joy, a happiness that is only possible when dwelling inwardly in solitude. And even one can join, if one doesn't want to practice meditation exclusively by oneself, there are various opportunities over the internet to join meditation groups or Dhamma discussion groups or to listen to Dhamma discourses. And so one could be practicing alone, but in community, communion with others, in association with others. And as one comes to dwell within through the practice of meditation, then one comes to enjoy the solitude, to cherish it. And this becomes a kind of ideal way of dwelling, to dwell fixed within the body, to dwell within one's own feelings, to dwell within one's mind, descending into deeper, more peaceful, more tranquil states of mind, and to come to know and to understand more clearly the contents, the workings, the operation of one's mind. And so in this way, one finds dwelling in solitude to be a precious opportunity to discover the peace, the joy of what is called the nekama sukha, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of solitude. And while we dwell in solitude, through our practice, we could develop at a deep level communion with others through the practice, especially the development of metta and karuna, loving kindness and compassion. So through loving kindness, we generate, we spread our mind out over first our place of residence, the building in which we're living, in my case, the monastery where I'm living, could be your apartment building, your, your street, your neighborhood, extending to everyone the wish that they might be well, happy, and safe. And then you spread that mind of loving kindness further throughout the whole country, wishing all the people in the U.S. be well, happy, and safe. And then extend it to the whole world, wishing that everyone in the world is well, happy, safe, and able to preserve good health. So that is the practice of loving kindness. And then when you think about the people who have fallen ill, who are suffering from the virus, who might be lying in the hospital bed, attended by nurses, having difficulty breathing, and you think about the relatives who are looking after them anxiously, 
Then you develop the mind of compassion, thinking of all the people afflicted with suffering and generate the wish, may they all be free from suffering. And then one could bring to mind all of the people who are sacrificing their own time, even their own health, and even putting their own life on the line to serve others, to serve complete strangers. We think of the doctors, the nurses, the other hospital staff, the service workers and the different service industries who are working to keep the economy running. And we could generate towards them a mind of great appreciation. This would be a kind of mudita, altruistic joy, rejoicing in their dedication, their selfless service, their activities, even self-sacrificial activities, putting their health and well-being at risk to serve others. And we rejoice in, in, in their activities. In this way, we generate a very pure, wholesome mind of altruistic joy. And so in this way, through loving kindness, compassion, and altruistic joy, even when we're living alone, we are establishing very deep, very strong, powerful connections with others. Connections which are founded upon the fact that our own life even though we might feel lonely and isolated, but we are never alone, never isolated, but we live within this very intricate, infinitely complex web of mutual dependencies. And so by generating loving kindness and compassion and altruistic joy, we are sending our mental waves out along the fibers of these nets of relationships and we are strengthening the well-being, the vibrancy, the solidarity of the whole. And this should give us a reason to be joyful, even in our solitude. Okay, with this, I will end this short presentation today. And again, I want to extend to everybody my best wishes for your well-being and health. And I'll end with some verses of blessing, calling upon the Anubhava, the spiritual power of the Triple Gem, to promote the well-being and happiness and safety of all of you. Sabitio viva jantu, sabarogo vinasatu, ma te bhavatu antarayo, suki di gayuko bhava. Bhavatu Sabha Mangalang, Rakantu Sabha Devata, Sabha Buddhanu Bhavena, Sada Soti Bhavantu Te. Bhavatu Sabha Mangalang, Rakantu Sabha Devata, Sabha Dhamanu Bhavena, Sada Soti Bhavantu Te. Bhavatu Sabha Mangalang, Rakantu Sabha Devata, Sabha Sanganu Bhavena, Sada Soti Bhavantu Te, by the spiritual power of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. May the Devas protect you, and may you all be well and healthy, and may you all be safe.